to another part of reading three and nine. And yeah, today today I said I was gonna finish off the final half of three and nine series, so let's get started. I guess let's put some music on poggers. I'm gonna lower the volume. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm loving this book so far. The twists are insane, but we'll see. All right. After this, I'm gonna show you guys where I got those manga manga images from from the last video. So, like, yeah. Shout out to that. All right, let's start. Chapter six: Nine of Swords. My mother died soon after I was born. From that point, it was just me, my older brother, and our dad. As far as back as I can remember, my dad was a monster. He took the mirror mom left us and used it entirely for himself, spending each day drinking it away. He made no effort to put it to good use, to do anything that might help our family. And when we acted, he was in a bad mood, what little safe haven we had was violently rested away. My brother acted more like a parent to me than dad ever did. Whether at home or out somewhere else, he always protected me. I really hated that house for it always felt like it was bearable when he was there by my side. Those days didn't last for long, however. I was still quite young when I, in the household ran out of money. And dad decided to put us to work. There weren't many options for a child to earn each much mirror though. And even by between my father and I, our income barely made a scratch in the mountain death. One day, my brother vanished and dad announced that he had let him spread his wings. In other words, he had abandoned him. It was at that point that I stopped thinking for that of that monster as my family. Even in such an awful con situation, I still held on to the idea that my brother would come back to me one day. That meant my only option was to stay there until he did. Three long years later, I finally received a letter from him. He wrote that he was in a miserable place, but that he was managing to stay alive. I was able to send him reply via the same method thrilled to have such a connection with him once again. I eventually found out he was forced to work as a killer for a shadowy society called The Organization. The things he said he had to do were awful, inhuman. Just from reading his words, I could feel his pain as though it were my own. He said that the organization was a nightmarishly strict and that it was only thanks to his partner that he was able to send me letters in the first place. My brother wrote a lot about his partner, describing him as a true friend, almost like a younger brother. This was a topic where I saw his writing soften, where he seemed happy. Naturally, I found myself wanting to meet this person, but that was impossible, and I knew it. I couldn't even meet my own sibling, let alone his partner in some secret ass assassin cabal. We continued exchanging letters like this for some time, but even that came to an end. The household ran out of mirror again, and I knew what was coming. I could tell it would soon be my turn to leave. I wrote my brother, telling him as much as... Telling him as much? He wrote back, telling me he and his partner had decided to escape the organization. I could sense from his words just how resolved he was to do it. He followed his declaration with a promise to come for me to get me out of the hellhole of a home. What followed, however, at the very end of his letter was a grim, grim note. Sounds like things are taking for a turn now. That was the. If, it, if this escape somehow ends in failure. I'm going to prioritize my partner's life over my own. Even if it comes down to it, I'll sacrifice everything to make sure he at least gets out of there. He could trust him. If anything happens, he could rely on him to help. 
That was the last letter I received from him. In the end, he never came back for me, and our dad kicked me out, just as I thought he would. He had become a slovenly mess. From the look of it, he had got himself addicted to some nasty substances. The kind that quickly drained one's finances. I knew they were destroying him physically as well, but I had, him, had stopped caring a long time ago. I was done with that. Disgusting scumbag I once called my dad. <laughs> I used an intermediary mediary, to secure an opportunity to join the organization. It was right as I was entering training that I learned of my brother's death. I was told he was killed by his own partner. It was then my world began to fall apart. I threw myself headlong into my training, not thinking of anything else. I was distraught on trying to escape reality however I could. I ignored everyone around me, even myself. I let my soul slip into hibernation and fully assumed the role of one the organization's tools. During the day, I would follow orders, not thinking for myself, but then night would come and I have nothing to distract me. My mind would be tormented by thoughts of my brother's passing, the realization that I would now truly be alone in this world shook me, as did the notion that my hands would soon be irreversibly stained with blood. Once the fear set in, there was no escaping and I gradually lost the ability to sleep properly. The body does have a limit, of course. And I eventually fall unconscious for about an hour a night. Two, if I was really lucky, it, but if it wasn't much sleep, not really. It was too fa far too shallow for me to physically or mentally recover much. And what little rest I did get was plagued with nightmares. Even after I had woken up, those bizarre, horrid sensations were made. A year passed like this, with no improvement whatsoever. Despite that, I was able to graduate from the factory at an exceptionally fast pace. That was when I had the final chance to meet him, the boy who had fought alongside my brother as his partner. He had just finished his own re-education. A consequence of betraying the organization as fate would happen, have it, we were assigned as partners. He was the one who had stolen my brother from me. So I resolved to despise him from the moment we met. I quietly kept a close eye on him, observing each and every one of his movements. Before long though, something unexpected is that happen. Perhaps all my pent up fear and exhaustion had finally boiled over. Perhaps it was just my instincts telling me the truth that I had been ignoring. Whatever the reason, one day we were out on a mission. I find myself able to sleep when I was next to him. I met Ian actually sleep, deep and soundly for the first time in an entire year. There was something about his presence that gave me a sense of security. It was unlike how I remembered feeling being next to my brother strangely enough. When I woke up from this neat, much needed rest, so many things came rushing back. Suddenly, without warning, I found myself bawling as those tears came pouring out. The chains that had been sealed away my heart slowly began to loosen. I started feeling human again. I could feel my emotions for the first time what felt like an eternity. As soon as he saw me crying, the boy quickly came over to console me, but that just made me sob harder. I quickly discovered my new partner was really the person was the person my brother wrote so fondly about. Blunt and a little awkward, but overall a deeply kind person and a thoughtful partner. Despite being shackled to the organization and forced to kill for years, he had yet to fully surrender his humanity. He did seem to be bearing a great sorrow, one far more intense than anything my brother had described. 
I could tell he wasn't a kid capable of betraying and murdering a friend to ensure his own survival. What up, guys? <laughs> have to drink water every time given my brother's letter it wasn't hard to work out what had really happened after making their escape the two were back to a, into a corner and their prospects were grim rather than both of them being killed it was better than at least one of them survived the only way for that to happen was for the one to kill the other to gain forgiveness in the eyes of the organization my brother knew his partner would reject the idea outright, and that even if he did accept it, he would insist on playing the part of the sacrifice. I was absolutely sure of that much. That's why my brother had enough feigned betrayal in order to get his partner to fight back and ultimately kill him. It was a plan that would spare his partner's life, but also deeply scar him in only the way an unexpected betrayal could. From that point on, being near him was the only way to feel I was secure enough to sleep. And sleep I did every chance I got. Midday during our missions, even if there was the slightest opportunity, I was out like a light. After all, I needed to catch up on the year of rest I'd, robbed, I'd been robbed of. It was truly a surprising turn of events for me to say the least. I soon learned the boy was tormented by constant nightmares. I imagine the incident with my brother played a big role. There were so many moments where I saw how he was suffering and wanted, and wanted to tell him the truth. But I always stopped myself at the very last second, telling myself the time wasn't right. Our missions occasionally called for performances of sort her to deceive onlookers. He was always pretty terrible at it. It was hard to say why exactly that was though. His movements were fine enough as his, were his spatial expressions. The factory emphasized all those things in, his, in its teachings so he had received ample instruction there. It was that he always seemed to overdo things or drastically un underdo them. I wondered if it may have something to do with the unshakable seriousness he always seemed to have about him. It could be a real problem sometimes, even to the point where he would be more of a liability than an asset. Any onlooker with half a brain would be able to tell something was less genuine about his performances. I can, to the conclusion, he was just naturally bad at deceiving others. That's why I had to keep my plans for him to prevent his terrible poker face from giving us away. He'd been earnestly working on his escape for a very long time. I, of course, understood the immense difficulty of his task, and why he kept it to himself. Still, it made me a bit sad that he never spoke to me about it. He was in a precarious position given that the organization still had his doubts about him, I wasn't about to do anything to put him at risk, of course, but a shaky acting alone could, well, led to the organization seeing through his carefully laid scheme. If that had happened, it would be the end of him, no question about it. The situation hadn't quite reached that point yet, but I knew it was only a matter of time before it did. After Halidor Baron mission had wrapped up, I went to make my report. The man I reported to it or had an aura like anything I ever felt. He was evil. He was the evil bastard who managed the two of us. The organization's overseer, the emperor. He was the one forcing us to kill. His face always obscured by a robe, but it feared to mask the malice overflowed from him. That day, he had a quiet, deadly exuberance about him, like a hawk that locked onto its prey. There was no mistaking it. I knew he had caught onto my partner. He knew he intended to betray the organization again. I knew he would gleefully purge him when the time had came and the time was getting closer each and each passing day. If that's how things were going to be, I told myself. I would just get ahead of him and put my own plan into motion. 
Hamper's intentions were obvious. Aware of my cruel history my partner and I shared, he had made us partners bid in a bid to slowly push toward revenge. He knew I'd eventually break and sell my partner out, forcing him to go through another bitter betrayal. The Emperor was looking forward to watching it all unfold. We were both tools of the organization and the personal playthings of the Emperors. So I decided to give him exactly what he wanted to see. Once I finished my mission report, I told the Emperor my partner's intent to betray the organization. Then I shared my plan to lure him to a specific place where I would then eliminate him. I gave a detailed explanation on making it as enticing as possible for the Emperor. It was easy enough to, to gain his consent, even with his face hidden under his cowl. He could hardly contain the excitement in his voice over the coming slaughter. The laugh that escaped his throat was so sound, so vile, it still haunts me to this day. Later that evening, my partner arrived at the designated location. At the base of a hill deep within the mountains. At first, he was horribly shaken by the realization that he'd been betrayed again. When he did when he learned who my brother was, his face changed. I watched his surprise turn to despair, which in turn shifted to absolute acceptance to his of his fate. To what I call a heart wrenching. Didn't do it much justice though. I focused my efforts on giving him the most vicious glare possible. One equal parts mocking and murderous, I came up with the most foulest, malicious things I could bear to say. I tried to cut them as deep as possible. After all, the Emperor was standing right next to me, and if I was trying to be convincing, I couldn't afford even the slightest hesitation. I stepped forward. I was going to eliminate him. I shifted close to my partner in order to facilitate my wire attacks, or so I made it appear. My true objective was to put some distance between myself and the Emperor. Once I had my wires around his neck, the battle was as good as over. From there, I knew I could end his life with the flick of a finger. This is the end. I meant those words from the bottom of my heart. A transparent cord through the center of the web of wires under my control, manipulating this cord allowed me to set up a chain reaction that twisted a complex spiral shape. I would often use it to trap distant foes during missions. Fully focused on watching his toys and the throes of bloodthirsty vengeance, it was the Emperor who had relaxed his guard the most. Right at the climax of our battle, I seized the opportunity with perfect timing. I was able to ensnare the unwitting Emperor leaving him shackled and immobile, but the key was the transparent cord. It may not have been the same cutting power as my metal wires, but it was more than twice as strong. Even so, I couldn't count on it to hold the Emperor for so long. Without a moment's delay, I summoned all my strength to pull on another cord. A low rubber sounded out, and the section of a rocky hill collapsed, dropping a torrent of rubble below. I had taken the, my time to, for the perfect location. One with brittle bedrock that I could break away on cue. The stones roared and tumbled on a huge wave, hurling down toward the Emperor. In the middle of it all was a giant boulder more than 10 arch cross. Uh. Whew. Time seemed to slow down as, felt, as it fell directly on the Emperor's head. The thunder of the rock side drowning as all other sound. Finally, it all came crashing down. The aftermath, what it looked like a catastrophic earthquake had taken place, the Emperor had taken a direct hit from a massive boulder. There's no way he could have survived that. Even if he had somehow had, he was now buried alive. My partner looked on in confusion, still processing what had just happened. S! I cried out, finally used the name I preferred to call him by. I ran over to him, buried my head in his chest. This is where I felt the most safe, by his side. I nuzzled up against him, holding him tight, never wanting to let him go. I, ne I had never hugged him before then. I have always been too afraid to s do so. 
I'm so sorry I said those horrible things. I sobbed. I couldn't tell you the truth. But there was more to explain. But those were the things I wanted to say him the most. Even though he was still reeling from everything that just happened, he was still kind enough to hold me close and try to calm me down. Nine, what in the world? Before he could finish his sentence, something I predicted happened, never predicted happened. The small mountain of fallen rocks and boulders shifted slightly. Pebbles began to ride up into the air. It was slow, but unmistakable. What's happening? Dumbfounded, all we could do is look on in confusion. It was some kind of space element art. There's no way I'm used aloud. No, that didn't seem right. Perhaps it was some kind of device the fu that functioned the same way as an anti-ship's anti-gravity components. I didn't understand what was happening. I just sat there staring blankly, my mind racing for an explanation before I could reach one. However, my partner spoke, his voice steeped in panic. That's the overs the Emperor's power, but that would mean it meant the Emperor was still alive. More and more rocks began to flow upward, taking their place among the ever-increasing collection gently balanced in the air. Nine, we need to move. I continually sit there, absolutely dumbfounded. Three grabbed my hand, and we set off at a sprint. We were able to cover a good amount of distance before we heard what sounded like a massive explosion behind us. We turned to see the boilers and rocks of all sizes and being flung upward into the sky, like a volcano erupting before our eyes. To be continued. Alright, I guess we got to see mo at least like Nine's perspective of things. I guess. Damn. I guess she was also planning for this to happen. Alright, let us continue. Chapter 9 Anger and Analysis. 9. Three ran over to her. her. His voice hoarse with agony and grief. Her forehead, hands, and legs, her entire body were stained with blood, dripping from a thousand scratches and cuts. It was a fate far too cruel for such a young girl. No matter how many times Three called out to her, she didn't respond. Had he sworn to protect her, he had promised himself, promised her, but now... Three felt himself overcome by shame and regret. I'm too weak, he thought to himself. Too weak to help anyone. Too weak to save anyone. As if to seize upon his distress, the Emperor spoke once more. So one of you ended up making it. If you're smart, you'll stop here, deliver the final blow, and your life will be spared, just as before. As those words, three felt a creaking in his mind. It was harsh, like the sound of metal scraping against metal. I imagine she'd take some sick satisfaction in being killed by the same person who killed her brother anyway. Nepper's mouth twisted into a perverse smile, the depravity in his eyes, clear as though even drew the shadow by his helmet. It was then that something snapped inside of Dre. Ah, die! He exploded, as if the boundless rage coursing through his veins had at last found an outlet. His legs and arms snapped into operation. A primal rumble burst from his throat, his burst creak, and his blood boiled. Pure fury ignited his body, inciting it to action, and before he knew it, he had launched himself at the Emperor. He unleashed a whirlwind of attacks, his laser strikes faster and more powerful than ever before. The Emperor met the charge head-on, altering gravity as he went, but three adapted to each shift almost as fast as they came. His body was running on pure instinct, sharpening his senses to a razor-sharp edge and giving him almost preternatural adaptability. The Emperor, 
on the other hand, found himself working harder and harder to handle three hail of blows. He managed to unblock the uncommon strikes, but his attacker showed no sign of slowing down. Like a wild dog, the Emperor sneer. A tool with a will of its own is a useless thing, to be sure. But seeing you foaming at the mouth like this is pathetic beyond measure. You truly are fated to die as you lived, a mere thing. Even in the face of entries and rage onslaught, the Emperor had hardly taken any damage at all. He still held all the cards. Three was little more than an annoyance, like a flea biting a wolf. Three's thoughts bubbled up back to the surface. He found himself remembering something Nine had said. It was his natural sense of composure that allowed him to recall such a timely memory. Composure he did not possess three years ago. He continued to let his anger drive his body, but maintain a calm mind, not allowing his thoughts to slip away in his rage. He could have stopped himself at any time, but found his current rage beneficial, and wielded wielded it ably. As though it was simply another weapon available to him, Three himself was unaware of this, but such an ability was not only control one's emotions, but turn them into power was rare indeed. It was a skill that did not come easily to even the greatest warriors, yet. Three had managed to master such a complicated concept at such a young age. Armor, that absorbs the force imparted by the text the moment they are received. That was how Nine had described the Emperor's armor. Sure enough, just as he described, no matter how many strikes Three launched, nothing seemed to get through. It was then that realization dawned on him. If the armor was immune to external force, then what he needed to do was induce internal force. Anyone else may have given up at this point, but Three could scarcely imagine a more suitable target for his unique skill set. His combined blades squaring off against the Emperor yet again, the defining characteristic of Three's weapons was the ability to internally induce an art space explosion in their target. To do so, he needed to strike the same point with each blade separately. And then a third time in their fused form, by this point, he already ha landed a number of hits on the Emperor's armor and, luckily for Three, a decent amount of hits overlapped. All that remains was the final step in the process, making contact with those intersecting points using his fused sword. Three attacked the Emperor with the rage and power as before. This time, though he failed to land a single hit, he was just a hair's breadth off every single time. The first steps in his weapons process were relatively simple. He simply needed to land a strike with each weapon, creating two perpendicular lines that would paint a target for the orbment. The next part, however, was far more difficult. He needed to use the fused blade to hit the precise point where two lines intersected. This was much of a small tar taller target area, making the risk that much more demanding. Still, Three was confident in his aim. He knew he had the dexterity to pull it off. In spite of his skill and confidence, however, he continually found himself failing to land the decisive hit. The Emperor cackled in delight as he watched Three struggle. To him, Three's plight was nothing short of pure comedy. I know my tools inside and out, he said. And a dark, a dark grin spreading across his face. Your methods of an attack, how your weapons work. I understand these things even better than you. As if proving the Emperor's point, Three's next attack fell short as well. The Emperor launched a counterattack with his staff, swung at a perfect angle. Three had figured out his foe's attacks. Right before each of his attacks would land, the Emperor would make a subtle change of gravity. His timing was exquisite, and the trick was executed in such a way that Three had no time to correct the angle of his sword. Further, the gravity wave emitted by the Emperor's scepter did nothing at all when it failed to connect. But even if it did, the resulting damage would be enormous. Thus far, Three had been able to evade or turn away each incoming swing. But he knew it was only because the Emperor was allowing it. He had yet 
land such a single effective attack, and the where both his weapon and his body was steadily mounting. The outcome of the battle seemed clear, and by all appearances, there was nothing he could do to change its course. Thanks to his impeccable defense, the Emperor was nearly as unscathed, whereas three was barely holding on, looking more and more like he could collapse at any point. In between clashes, a momentary calm settled over the battlefield. As three was weighing his options, a voice broke the silence. It was a lazy drawl, one that three had heard many times over the past year. Analysis complete. Nine struggled to her feet, looking as though she could fall back down at any moment. How? The Emperor's genuine shock escaped his mouth with in a low hiss. Nine, you're okay, Three exclaimed. At once, he understood what had happened. Nine hadn't fallen unconscious. Con unconscious. She had simply feigned in doing so in order to analyze the Emperor in secret. She had given three no indication of her plan whatsoever. After all, had she done so, the Emperor may have very well caught on to her plan. Just fine, she responded. I used my wires to cushion the blow of the boulders by shredding them into smaller pieces. In the end, the rocks barely scratched me. Judging me by the moment of blood to cover her, it would have been clear to anyone as far from the truth that the fact remained that she was both alive and conscious. Three disengaged from the Emperor and moved closer to Nine, making sure to keep his eyes trained on his foot as he did so. There is a moment of weakness where he is unable to respond to anything. That is power's fatal weakness. What, what do you mean? His gravitational manipulation doesn't require casting like an art would. But after he uses it, there is a period of time, about a second, before he is able to use it again. That's why he's able, he wasn't able to immediately prevent the firing rocks from burying him earlier. By the way, he's changing gravity is so precise, Dree said, thinking back on their battle. How could he have managed that? He was just reading your movement, S. He knows that you fight like the back of his hand. Wait, what? Dree exclaimed, the surprise of his, in his voice clear. It's true, Nine responded. The way he manipula manipulates gravity is determined before you even start your strength, your swing. He knows that your tendencies very well, and uses that knowledge to predict your actions. Is that is that even possible? Asked Three, his mind racing. It is unfortunately, Nine responded, and he's not using an artifact for it either. His mind just works that quickly. He's a monster through and through. The Emperor let out a low chuckle. A sound analysis will be availed to nothing. I know your techniques inside and out. The same speed, the same power, the same angles each and every time. There's no way you can possibly undo years of the habits be painstakingly drilled into you. S. Nine looked up at him knowingly. Right. He responded. Let's end this. The duel nodded in agreement and turned to face the Emperor once more. Three charged at him again, renewing his previous assault. He raised his sword overhead, attacking it at a high angle. The Emperor dodged it effortlessly and sent forth a counterattack. Their deadly dance continued as before. Just as, bef just as things were, both sides knew it would ultimately lead. The Emperor had sent an incoming attack and prepared to manipulate gravity. Just predicted, three attacked a half step faster, aiming for one of the spots in his armor that had been previously marked. As the sword raced towards its target, a gravity shifted and the sword's trajectory was altered. Despite this, it somehow continued on its original path regardless, as if the altered gravity had been predicted and compensated for. Bakana, impossible, the Emperor. Emperor muttered under his breath. He hastily jerked his body out of the blade's trajectory with hardly a second to spare. Three's movements had changed somehow. As the Emperor mulled the changing situation over, Three's next attack came speeding in. The Emperor again predicted the speed and trajectory the man and manipulated gravity accordingly, however. 
Boom. A muffled explosion rang out, and the Emperor felt his armor crack and pain course through his left arm. Boom. What? An another flash. Boom. His right leg was now damaged as well. The Emperor was at an utter loss. Had three managed to correctly predict his special manipulation, spatial manipulation? How was he suddenly al able to alter his strikes to compensate for the far gravity? For the gravity? Had the analyzer been analyzed himself? Cursing threesing, Emperor's thoughts grew frantic. As he desperately looked around for a clue, he realized what was happening. He glimpsed the number of barely visible cores extending from Three's body. Naturally, Nine stood at the other end, controlling them. She wasn't pulling them to and fro like a marionette, but was instead nudging his attacks slightly. Guiding his direction, timing, and angle to create such a perfect strike. Hamper may have been predicting Three's attacks and making adjustments, but Nine was doing the same to him in turn. It was her guidance that allowed Three to score direct hit after direct hit. Her superior intelligence was, of course, a major reason this was possible, but her relationship with Three was her true secret weapon. The two knew each other better than anyone else in the world, which allowed her to predict his reactions and movements with incredible accuracy. She used her natural understanding of her partner to help him adapt to his combat style, to fit the situation at hand. In that sense, the secret behind the upper hand they had suddenly gained was simple as it could be. You little bitch, the Emperor let out enraged growl, laced with bitter hatred neither three nor nine had ever seen him like this before. He tried to launch the same rocky onslaught at nine he had before, but found himself bereft of munitions. He could not be sure when it happened, but at some point, the duo had led him to a different part of the area, one where, where he could no longer weaponize the terrain. With furious bloodlust, he lowered the gravity near him and rushed at nine. Finally, she smirked. I've been waiting. A giant boulder appeared in the air above the Emperor, like you do to an art nine had cast. The Emperor was unimpressed, however, at being subjected to the same attack twice. This time around, it even lacked the element of surprise. Easy shattered the incoming boulder with his staff once it entered reduced gravity, but it was the footman display of arrogance that sealed his fate. As the pieces of boulders rained down upon around him, he found himself face to face with a plush toy rabbit, one that had been hidden within the boulder. No! he exclaimed. Knowing full well, it was no mere toy. His realization came too late, however. With a massive bang, the rabbit detonated. Light and heat washed over the Emperor, and his legs buckled under the force. Just then, as another explosion went off his, at his back, Three had landed a solid lit hit on his chest armor, and the chest and resulting blast had blown it clear off his body. This is the end, Three said quietly. The black-hearted Emperor's armor had been destroyed, and Three's blade had found its bloody mark to be continued. We're up to one last chapter now. So yeah, it looks like they turned their tides on the Emperor and and they actually won. It. Now, chapter 10, SNN, should be the shortest chapter and it's the final chapter. The Emperor had fallen to his knees. Three sword protruding his chest. He looked up at the sky and gave a dry, bitter laugh. Found some humor in your end, have you? Asked Three. You think you two would be would best me? Emperor said, his voice weak. Heh. I admit it. I underestimated you. You are far, by far, the most powerful tools I have ever pleasure of owning. Enough. We are no longer your tools, no longer. Three said, gripping his sword, preparing himself to silence the Emperor forever. So, he thought to himself, the moment to kill had come yet again. 
the thing he hated most. The thing. Hold up, guys. <laughs> he would never grow accustomed to. Things were different this time. Given that the man who stole away his humanity in the first place now sat at the end of his sword. But that didn't stop Three's hand from trembling. S. Nine gently moving closer. We'll do it together, okay? Her typically light and relaxed expression was now serious and sincere. Okay. Three responded. This was it. The moment where two would put their tragic past to rest. Nine placed her hands on Three, steadying his weapon. Her warmth abated his trembling ever so slightly. They moved to raise the sword together. In response, the Emperor spoke once more. Every arch of your path thus far had been stained with blood, just as the rest of your lives shall be. Your fates are immutable. Kill or be killed. Control or be controlled. You will end up no different than I. We will ever be one and the same. You're wrong, said Nine. No longer anyone's tools will never force anyone to be ours. After this, we're done, Dree said. You're the last person we're ever going to kill? The two took a deep breath and spoke in unison. Farewell. Off in some far-flung region of Calvert, a whole strong carriage plodded along. Aside from the trains and most terrestrial transportation that long since switched to orbital cars, so such an old-fashioned mode of travel was a rare sight to see, the more rustic method did have its certain undeniable charm, however. The boy drove the carriage, while a young girl of about the same age lays with, about within. Makes you wonder how he got that way, the boy said. Thinking back to the Emperor's face, the one that had been obscured by both cloth, cloak, and helmet, his appearance had been a poor fit for his monstrous behavior. If anything, he had been rather handsome. Well, if you don't mind the rumors and hearsay, have my answer for you, or two for you. Girl's response came within the carriage, delivering her sleepy draw. I'm listening. Well, the girl's story went something like this. In a small country in some corner of the world, there once lived a vile, oppressive king. His reign was tyrannical, his evil rule, and his people lived in fear. One day, he died and his son, the crown prince, was enthroned. The prince, this new king, was, at his core, a kind and gentle soul who strove to govern in a fair and just manner. He was determined to avoid his father's errors, but perhaps because they were too accustomed to fear. No one met this new king's idea with an open mind. Free assembly and speech had already been brutally suppressed during his father's reign, and the people's rage had already reached a boiling point. Violent voices grew louder and louder, eventually resulting in a revolution. The Republic, the Revolutionary Army launched an assault on the royal palace. And forced to be converted the country into a republic, holding the new king accountable for his father's sins, suddenly finding his life at risk, he had no choice but to flee, leaving behind his country and his entire way of life. You're telling me this prince eventually became the overseer, the boy asked. His brow working thought as he turned the story over in his head. Who can I say, shrugged the girl. I don't know if a kingdom that even existed in the first place. The girl rolled over to continue the dozing as the carriage bumped and bounded its way along the road. Assuming that this is more fact than fiction, then what? The boy asked. He was too kind and lost control of his kingdom, so you develop a powerful desire to control utter others. It's hard to believe. The boy trailed off as he had no intention of giving the overseer a, even a shred of sympathy. But strangely enough, he did find himself feeling a little pity for the man. The boy and girl felt silent for a few moments. The only sounds that could be heard were the clopping up the horse's hooves and the creaking of the carriage. Um... The boys broke the silence. What is it? The girl raised her head from her nap. Her voice remained as relaxed as ever. But the boy's tone suddenly grew tense. 
Is there any chance you could ever forgive me for what I did, for what I happened to me and your brother? No. The girl's response was swift and blunt. Boy, for silent, he had no right to scorn her answer. Never, she continued. Because he was my brother and I loved him, he was the only real family I ever had. So, so? Girl paused for a moment, her cheeks flushed red, and she continued in a much louder voice. So if you want me to forgive you, you can't ever leave me. We need to stick together. Through thick and thin, you and me, N and S. The boy smiled, his fear a moment ago having left him. Of course, we'll always be there for each other. I'll have your back, and you'll have mine. The girl could be barely contain the emotion swelling out in her chest at this point. Unfortunately for her, the boy continued talking. I'll do my best to fill in his shoes from now on. It includes to making sure you get the education you grow into the best person you can be. This was in fact not the answer the girl had been looking for. <laughs> I'm not talking about education, she exclaimed as she violently started shaking the carriage in frustration. What could be more important? Hey, calm down. This thing can't take too much abuse. It's rickety enough as it is. If you make it fall apart, we'll just have to walk the rest of the way. The girl settled down. Still not fully satisfied with his response to resolve to leave things for the moment. The topic changed again. So any ideas? For the time being, their plan was to head to La Burrow or Le Mans. Just as the boy initiate a plan, but where to from there? They had yet to give it much thought. They knew they would be pursued by any number of people from the organization. Despite this, the two knew that as long as they stuck together, they'd find a way to manage. For the moment, they reveled in the idea of an unknown future. A new path to tread was their that was all their own. In any case, we need to find some work, the boys said. Anything in mind? Well, he mused his confident smile growing in his face when we consider our skill shit. How about something in theater? Not on your life, the girl swiftly retorted. Think about it, S. You're a terrible actor. Hey, I'm not that bad. I'm sure a play would be less, way less pressure than an assassination mission. Tad deflated, the boy sank back into his seat, but then threw out another idea, but somewhat more plausible than the last. I know. How about we come become bracers? No way the girl reject the idea again, but with a less bit less bite than before. I heard they got they get super busy. No escape in one grade to work yourself over into another. There was also the question of hanging the air over whether the bracer grid would even consider taking on people with the duo's unique background. All things considered, however, it wasn't the most outlandish idea. Fine, fine, what's the bright idea then? Me? The girl yawned. All I want to do is lay around in bed every day. Just sleep, sleep, sleep. You're ridiculous, the boy sighed. His fate lit up suddenly as he remembered something. All right. Hmm? What is it? Names. He said when an hint of excitement. I just realized. We haven't shared our real names with each other, right? All right. N is short for Nadia. That's my neat real name. Mine Swin. Huh? The girl said hiding a small smile so S wasn't too far off then. Pretty crazy coincidence. There's a good reason for her nickname to mean so close to his real name. Her brother had mentioned in one of his letters she had known Swin's name before her past even cross. After they had worked together for a bit, she had decided to call him by something that resembled his actual name, rather than his organization moniker. This, however, was something she intended to keep to herself. Well, in the end, you'll, be, you'll always be S to me, and I'll be Zen to you, right? Yeah, you're right. The carriage continued to slow roll forward, as did their conversation. It was profound at moments, but otherwise silly, lighthearted, and most of all free. The boy's name was Swin, S. The girl's name was Nadia, N. 
Together, they were travelers. Travelers discovering their hum newfound humanity. The end. Hmm. That was a great book. Not gonna lie. Now, I have fully prepared myself for Hajimari no Kiseki. Knowing... Having to know that... That this book was so important. But regardless, yeah. <laughs> As a... For those watching right now, I'm currently... Streaming... Hajimari no Kiseki on my Twitch channel. So if you guys want to see that firsthand before I make videos, you guys can see it. Otherwise, after this video uploads, you're going to have to wait a while. So like, yeah. So next time, we're going to be showing after this 3 and 9 series, this book, or Hajimari no Kiseki. And I'll see you guys all next time. Alright, <laughs> let us start chapter 7, Tears and Promises. 3 and 9 ducked into a mountain cave on the outskirts of Luzin. They had fled from the Emperor as fast as their legs could carry them. And they were now told, now they were completely out of breath as they sat together. 9 told 3 everything she had kept up from him until then she told him about ace about herself the details of her plan and finally what really happened that cave three years ago at the start three occasionally chimed in or asked questions but as the conversation went out he fell silent by the hand he was his head was so hung so low that nine can see his expression he had been utterly convinced that his friend his one true friend had betrayed him. And when in reality, Ace had sacrificed his life to ensure three would survive. And as thanks for that incredible selfless act, three had no not only killed him, but he spent the strat three years despising his memory. And then came his sister, risking her life to save her brother's killer. Three felt his chest well. <laughs> <laughs> Tighten up in a wild mix of emotions ran through his head, threatening to overpower him. He was grateful for the f being fortunate enough to have two people in his life, Ace and Nine, who he could fully trust. At the same time, he felt a violent swell of anger burst up, anger at himself, the pathetic excuse for a human being he, he was. Battered by a storm of emotion, his breathing came to increasingly ragged. S, are you crying? Nine looked on in concern, having finished her story. She didn't need a response, however. Three's pained silence spoke volumes. I'm fine, he said, returning his blunt, usual blunt tone. Is there anything I could do to make you feel better? Nine asked. I said I'm fine. Despite his words, Three's head still hung low. You're an awful actor. Even you're even a worse liar when you're not performing, you know that. Three sunk down to his knees. I moved over to him, taking his head in her hands. She began gently ruffling his hair, like a mother comforting a child. Are you head patting him? <laughs> Are you head patting him? For fuck's sakes! <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Fuck it. Fuck it, I guess. Everything's okay now, she murmured gently. It's okay. But I, I. Three stammered, his voice was getting weak and hoarse. The last bits of Three's facade broke down. Overwhelmed by Nine's kindness, and he relented at last. Nine was younger than Three and definitely looked apart. But in that moment, she growed an almost motherly level of understanding and compassion. 
for someone like Three who grew up without that warmth, it was his first time being comforted by someone, his first time feeling the warmth of family. I know how strong he had to be, yes. I know it's been hard. I know how hard it's been for so long, but it's okay now, I promise. No longer to hold his emotions back, he finally broke down. A lifetime's worth of tears came flooding out of his eyes at once. <laughs> I'm such a wretched excuse for... He sobbed, no longer to control his voice in the slightest. Hot tears poured down his cheeks, staining the cool flower of the cave. It's not true. You know that's not true. Nine said softly, continuing to run her fingers through his hair. Why am I still alive? Why isn't Ace here instead? He weakly slammed his fist against the ground in frustration. Not a, w not a word of that. I won't hear it. You're the one has been here for the past few years. U.S. It's because of me, that Ace. Listen. That means you need to fight twice as hard. And living for him too now. I... I... Three words failed him as he was overtaken by sobbing. His years of pain and suffering poured out of him. After some time, Three was able to calm down himself down somewhat and regain his composure. I'm here for you too. So you don't have to cry. Nine told him. But if you ever want to, then that's okay too. So which is it then? Three retorted, his attached meaner creeping back. He suddenly became aware of the fact that he was in her arms and hurriedly pulled away. He immediately turned the conversation back towards exchanging info in an attempt to mask his sudden embarrassment. They finished catching up and turning their attention to the, the current predicament. So the overseer figured me out. He knew I was trying to make a run for it, and that's why you moved to strike first in order to outmaneuver him. Three thought out loud. That's right. I've been watching the whole time, waiting for the perfect opportunity to take him down. I wish he told me before him. And let you swallow the enemy of surprise with your awful acting skills? Nine grave a Y grin. Yeah, I don't think so. Three's face scrunched up a bit. Both Nine and the Emperor had caught on to his plan, so there was little room to defend himself in that regard. I chose the moment he'd be most distracted, Nine continued, switching to a serious expression. My timing was perfect. My preparations were more than enough, yet, despite all that, despite everything, despite being buried under a pile massive of boulders, the Emperor was still very much alive. No matter how much she thought, Nine simply couldn't figure out how it was possible. It was like his power at work, Three said. You said the same thing earlier, right as they took off running. What exactly is his power? I'm fairly certain he can control the gravity somehow. Three said he did something similar three years ago when Ace and I fought him. Three I wrenched an open, bitter, painful memory and began relaying what he remembered to Nine. He and Ace had been fanning off the first two assailants sent by him by the organization. It was then they, they faced the Emperor, however, even with the element of surprise on their side. Even when their coronary attacks perfectly faced him proved exceptionally difficult. They found their bodies heavy and clumsy, their movements lacing precision skilled Emperor, on the other hand, was nibble as he could be. Almost inhumanly so, and the two were quickly overpowered. So what do you think? Three looked at Nine and her input. There's no further sign starting any cast or charge up, so I doubt he was using arts. She said, her brow furred in thought. As for the possible gravity manipulation device small enough for a single person to carry out and con carry and concealed. Well, given modern technology, it's seriously hard for him to imagine. He might have an artifact or something like it. An avalanche can kill him. And he has enough precise control to be able to move individual stones and boulders. 
Nine scratched her head in frustration. Damn it. We really don't have a lot to go on here. She paused, thinking for a moment more, and then continued. In any case, unless something major ha cha changes, he's too powerful for us. Any attempt at a direct attack is going to result in our deaths. They fell silent for a time, until Three spoke up in, in a grave expression on his face. If the time comes when we have to choose, we're gonna have to prioritize your life, Nine. Need to be the one to k stop it. Nine silenced Three with an outburst of pure emotion, far more raw than her usual self. But then, at least you'll be able to. It Oops, suck. <laughs> Ignore that. If you die, I'm going right after you, she shouted. I'll do it myself if I have to. The calm, motherly figure before was nowhere near to be seen. Nine was in a frenzy now, almost like a child throwing a tantrum. Regardless of her tone, however, her words were heartful and earnest. I can't go back not being able to sleep. Her voice dropped to a whisper. I can't go back to being alone. And the weight of her feelings was as clear to three. Seeing this, he let a short sigh. Then, you have my word. No matter what happens, I'll protect you. And so now what I'm asking for. Okay, you're right. Taking the three said, taking a deep breath. Then I will promise that we'll survive this. We'll get through it together. Nine looked with, at three with employing almost pleading eyes. You swear? I swear, he said. Now if we're gonna have any chance of all, we'll need to do everything perfectly. The rock slide was massive enough despite the fact that he survived it. It was hard for him to imagine the Emperor was completely unscathed. And if they try to flee now, the organization would quickly find him again. And they would have to contend with the Emperor at his full strength. The pair knew they were going to make a move, now was the time. Let's do it then. We'll take him out. Will to be continued. Damn. So... Damn. So Nine thought this plan out. Seriously. <laughs> at least the feelings were mutual, at least. That's completely nice to hear. Alright. Let's start. Next chapter. Chapter 8. Gravity and Artifacts. 3 and 9 returned to the hill. And more accurately, where the hill used to be. It was now completely unrecognizable. A sizable chunk of it was gone. Having been strewn about the area in the form of countless bits of rubble, the Emperor stood right where they had left him. Seemingly unfazed, as three and nine had surmised, he has sustained at least some manner of injury. Nothing major, but his ever-present robe under he had hidden his face had been reduced a little more than shredded than a shredded cape. Underneath, he wore a gold hammer bearing a crown design. In his hand, he carried a golden scepter with a spherical tip. His body was covered in golden armor. The word ostentatious was insufficient to describe his heavy glided <laughs> countenance. David, I can't see. <laughs> I can't speak those words. Okay. Everything about him suggested both needless grandeur and wicked condens condescension. I knew you'd be back. You two aren't complete fools, after all. The Emperor called out to them. Three and I remain silent as they slowly approached. So have you decided? Which will you two will gain the organization's forgiveness? Three and nine turned to each other and nodded. Three removed his hand from his sword, leaving it chief. Three knelt and closed his eyes, accepting acceptance, showing acceptance of what has to, was to come. In response, Nine pulled some of her poison ear and silently lodged at Three's neck, or at least, that's how she made it appear. 
the very last second. Before the needles parted from her fingers, she deftly altered the trajectory, sending them speeding towards the Emperor instead. The Venom projectiles, the wi which perf was perfectly through the air as ever. However, as they neared their intended target, they certainly curved downward sharply, plummeted harmlessly to the ground. Very well. I hear your answer loud and clear. The Emperor proclaimed, looking up at the pair. You both wish to die today. Not a chance, Nine called out. Throwing another volley of needles at directly at the Emperor, their trajectory suddenly shifted again, this time upward. From his kneeling position, three shifty quickly shifted his stance, pushed forward off the ground with all the power he could muster in his legs. He launched himself at the Emperor, breaking a full on charge. We've had enough. You're the one meeting their death, your death today. Three big hands slashing away at his target with incredible speed. His lightning quick strikes grew slow and sluggish as soon as they were near the Emperor. However, with assailant speed so drastically curbed, the man was able to use his golden scepter effortlessly to bat aside the boy's assault. At the same instant, Nine's second set of needles changed direction mid-air and began falling straight toward the Emperor. She had managed to calculate the range of his gravitational field with just a single throw. Once she understood its effect on projectiles, she was able to revise her trajectory. However, moreover, she had factored an increased acceleration into higher gravity, meaning her needles would hit harder than normal. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm just struggling. <laughs> Despite that, however, her attack was neutralized by a flick of the Emperor's gilded, gilded arm. It was still not enough to penetrate his armor. It was, however, more than sufficient to arouse his ire. You dare defy me? Me? Livid, he swung his scepter downward. Three immediately reacted and just barely managing to block the attack with his sword. Even so, the impact alone threw him back several arcs. Three could feel his brain rattling in his skull from the force of the blow. There was no way the Emperor's physical strength and the weight of the scepter alone could do that. It occurred to Three that there would be another way to manipulate gravity. You will be purged, the Emperor said in a low growl. The same words Three had heard him say a few hours ago and three years ago. And when the Emperor spoke like this, it was nothing less than arbitration of a death sentence. At the sound of those words, past memories bubbled up in Three's mind and up old terror began to gripe him. His legs grew wobbly and he started to stagger. One glance at Nine was all it took for him to restore his resolve, however. He forced himself back on his feet, reflexively snapping to a fight fl fighting stance. Nine continues to provide covering fire with her needles as three renewed his assault. Their approach was proved more, no more fruitful than before. Even so, as three continued to fight under such grueling conditions, he slowly became more capable. His understanding of his foe's gravitational trickery improved, and his strikes grew more swift and precise as a result. The way his muscles continually reacted, the angle and speed at which he swung his swords, he was slowly chipping away at the Emperor's overwhelming advantage. Though three may not have enjoyed the same powers of insight as part of Possess, his skills in close quarters combat were elite, even by the most exacting of standards. For a part, Nine's cover was solid and unwavering. Realizing her needles had no hope of piercing the Emperor's golden pl plating, she had instead began aiming for the gaps between its plate pieces. It was then an incredibly difficult task, but as she grew more accustomed to disrupting effects of the gravitational field, she was able to gradually get she was gradually beginning closer. She began weaving in offensive arts along with the volley of needles in order to keep the Emperor on his toes. Her attacks appeared simple enough for her foe to deal with, but they still managed to pull his attention away from three, even if only for a moment. 
The fight raged on, and after a bit of time, Three and Nine appeared to have finally gained the upper hand. Yet the Emperor did not seem to be phased in the slightest. His expression was unreadable beneath the shadows of his helmet, but as clear as though from his body, he still believed himself fully in control of the situation. Three managed to land an occasional strike, but even if his swords seemed to do little against the Emperor's possibly resilient armor, and attempt to land a heavier blow, Three launched himself into the air, tending to let the gravity carry his swords downward, just as Nine Zingos had. However, he found himself soaring up far higher than he had intended, impossibly so, as though he had suddenly sprouted wings. His mark completely missed. He lost his sense of balance and began tumbling through the air. He quickly realized it could have been more due more to of his full trickery. Reduced gravity. Expertly seizing the open opening. The Emperor raised his scepter overhead. He swung it downward. As it made making this motion, he suddenly dropped out of the air. Thrown to be a hard ground below like a rag dog. Gawk! <laughs> uh, the air knocked out of his lungs. Three cat struggled to catch his breath, splitting up mouthfuls holes of blood in between gaffes. Get out of the way. He's not done. Saved by Nine's frantic warning, Three had barely managed to roll out of the way. A split second later, the scepter slammed down to the ground where he had just been. The gravity enhanced scepter connected the rocky ground below. Let out a powerful blast, leaving the crater in his way. S. The resulting shockwave launched straight to the side, knocking him to relatively relative safely. Safety. Had he taken a direct hit, he would have been completely pulverized. Those days, as he still was there enough to signal to Nine that he was okay, he forced himself to his feet. The battle completely changed. The Emperor had begun manipulating gravity levels on a constant cycle, and Three was forced into a defensive position. Whenever he managed to get a handle on his full barrages of attacks, he found the gravity level altered yet again, forcing him to start back at zero. It was impossible for him to fight in such ever-changing conditions. The situation was taxing for Knight as well. She found herself forced to constantly recalculate the field's range and the gravity value, severely reducing the number of effective attacks she was able to launch. Despite their bleak outlook, the two of them continued to hold out. Even when pressured, Free served as an excellent vanguard that consistently denied the Emperor any opportunities for a decisive strike. Nine, meanwhile, continued to back him up flawlessly, acting with a surgical precision and ensured no opening went to waste. S. She called out as she left back, pulling some distance between himself and the Emperor. I think I've figured something out. Let's hear it. Three waited for her to continue keeping his guard up and watching closely for any sign of attack from the Emperor. Have you noticed anything different from when you and Ace fought him before? Was he carrying anything with his left hand then? Three glanced his foe's left hand, seeing empty. He's, he thought back to it three years ago. Now that you mention it, I'm sure he had an orb with him, purple, with a golden sculpture of a crow on it. The battle back then was completely one-sided, just as I suspected. Three had sensed something was different, but he had simply chalked it up to the Emperor touring with him, as he didn't consider it to be a true threat to him. Factoring in what Nine had just pointed out, however, cast things in much different light. Oh. So you realize. The Emperor pauses on side as those recognition of Nine's keen observation. You see the implements he has on him now? I suspect at one point he had four different artifacts that let him control gravity. Four, huh? Three said taking note of the Emperor's equipment. Right. A helmet with a crown motive, motive that can increase or reduce the overall level of gravity. Armor that absorbs the force imparted by attacks at the moment she, they're received. A scepter that sends out devastating gravitational wave when it makes contact with its target. And an orb with a crow perched on it. 
that allowed its leader to alter gravity on a target by ba target by basis. Non paused her explanation for a moment. She looked defiantly at the Emperor. The reason he had worn that tatter cloak was now clear. If someone un were to wield as so many artifacts as he at once as he did, it would be necessary to conceal them. Failing to do so would truly attract unwanted attention from the church. Now that you mention it, this time around, he has been moving faster. While slowing us down at the same time, Dries said. When we fought before, we couldn't even touch him. It was true in that fight against him. Three and Ace had been struggling under the different levels of gravity than the Emperor. There was no doubt he was toying with them in the present. But at the very least, both sides were ba battling under the levels of gravity. Constantly shifting toward... Shifting though as they were. As such, the pair's odds of winning were much better than this time around. I think he lost the orb at some point, or it was destroyed, or at least damaged in the rock slide, Nine explained. The pair realized if this were true, now that this was their best chance to take down the Emperor once and for all. A talented tool indeed. The Emperor's voice was so low, tinged with a hint of perverse delight. The artifacts I wear were collectively known as the Monarch's Regalia. I'm impressed you were able to analyze such capability. Their capabilities in such a limited amount of time. You, Nine of Swords, are truly outstanding. I don't want your praise, you bastard. Kisaba! Ignoring Nine's retort, the Emperor continued on his exhilaration, giving way to a violent savagery. But even the greatest tool of worthless is worthless, it will not submit to its rightful place in my hands. His body began levitating. Broken chunks of earth underfoot rising upward with him. With all the force he could muster, he swung his scepter in a nearby boulder. And worthless too, as I mu must be disposed of. In that instant, the boulder shattered into shards of shapes and sizes that were rocket in toward nine. Watch out, three cried out. The shards are flew like a salvo of bullets from a few thousand different guns. All them pointly directly at one target. It was a grim sight, not like, not like, unlike a so single soldier standing before the assault of an entire army. Panic. Three rushed into the line of fire. He brandished his swords and did everything he could to prevent the shards from reaching nine. He deflected what could, he broke what he could, using his body as the shield for the rest. But there was a considerable distance between him and nine. One he could not cover easily. By the time he had leapt in the way, a great many shards were also too far ahead. <laughs> Three was too late. Nine had no re realistic chance of avoiding entirely of the attack. Instead of devoting her effort to simply avoid the worst of the pieces of stone flying toward her. There were far too many, however, and one man managed to slip through her defenses. She managed to s suffer the direct hit to the abdomen. A red mist sprayed from her mouth as she coupled to the earth to be continued. Damn. Damn. The Emperor, they're trying to figure out the Emperor. But damn, it's actually a lot harder than they first thought. Alright, let's continue.